Hey guys, happy Wednesday. I hope everybody is doing well out there today. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time on here talking about installing applications on your Docker server. Uh, and a lot of times we want those applications to be accessible from the internet. Uh, and of course that sketches out a lot of people and it, and it should. Anytime you expose ports on your, your modem and your router, you're kind of inviting people into your home network. Um, so today what we're gonna do is kind of talk about what I, what I feel are some best practices to help mitigate some of those issues. Now I wanna be clear, um, I am in no way a network professional. I'm not a security professional. Um, these are just some things that I have read up on and have done some research on and, and have just kind of put together as my own personal notes for things that should help you uh, keep the bad guys out. Okay, so let's just kind of dive into this. Uh, I've got some notes down here that we're just gonna kind of read through a little bit uh, and, and just kind of talk about some very high level stuff at first and then we'll dive in to some more uh, in-depth stuff uh, a little later. But let's just kind of talk about the notes first. In fact, you know what? I'll just drag this up here like this. And again, this isn't meant to be an all-inclusive, definitely gonna work all of the time, Bad guys are bad guys. They'll find their way in if they really, really want in. But this is just a good roadblock to, to just say, hey, I'm not a complete idiot, move along. So right up here at the top, only open the ports you need. Uh, if you're using a reverse proxy on your server to give access to your, your applications, you should only need to open ports 80 and 443. Uh, 80 is just your standard unencrypted traffic. 443 is your SSL or HTTPS traffic. Those are the only two you should need to open by default, uh, unless you're using a VPN, but we will talk about that a little later. And that's actually why I've got ports 1194 listed here as well. That's a standard VPN port. Uh, that being said, you should probably not use 1194 because it's a standard VPN port. If you set up a VPN on your server, you should probably change it to some other random port. Using a, a, a third party service like Cloudflare for DNS, uh, services to manage all of your DNS, that sort of thing. But they also offer IP protection. Uh, when they when you can actually run a proxy on their service that will uh, hide your home server's IP address, your home IP address, the whole bit, if you, uh, basically, if you get this set up correctly, um, in fact, you know what, I'll just, I'll just show you. So I have, uh, I have, video.dbtech.site set up. This is not my home IP address. I just spun up a DigitalOcean uh, node or droplet, I guess they call them. And this is the IP address to get there. So uh, what I'm gonna do is, oops, I'm not gonna open that. I'm gonna open up a command prompt like so. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to ping uh, video.dbtech.site and here you can see that is the IP address of my server over on DigitalOcean. Uh, in fact, what I will do, uh, let's see if I've got it down here. Nope, I'll just open it up. DigitalOcean, sign in. Video.dbtech.site. In fact, if I open this up, here is that IP address. Um, that just kind of shows complete transparency. That's the IP address. So. If I, we can see that that's pinging just fine. It's got kind of some bad ping times, but what do you do, right? So now let's go over back over here uh, to here. Let's uh, turn DNS on and we'll click save. So now this is being proxied. Now we will have to give this a couple of minutes in order for this to fully take effect. Uh, but what we can do uh, is we can actually just ping that with a dash T. Um, and then hopefully here in a moment, uh, this should change. Uh, if it doesn't, the other thing we can do is um, IP config slash flush DNS. There we go. So now we're getting video.dbtech.site. Now we're getting a completely different IP address. And this is still, uh, if I had a site set up on DigitalOcean, this would still give us access to that site. But Cloudflare is actually uh, obfuscating or proxying our IP address through one of theirs. But if somebody does try to attack that IP address, uh, Cloudflare will actually uh, mitigate that through their DDoS protection. And that's all part of their free plan. Now, like I said uh, in my note, or like it shows in my notes here, they offer free SSLs. There's no reason not to take advantage of that. I've been using their free SSLs for like 
eight years, I think now, uh, on all kinds of different websites and home servers and uh, things that I've deployed literally all over the world. And uh, I've been using them and they work great. They're free. And it's just been a really great experience for as long as I've been using them. They've also got, a uh, uh, on their free plan, they've also got the option for additional firewall rules. So if we come over here and we actually go over to their firewall, um, <clears throat> managed rules, they've got some stuff in place just by default. Uh, this is very good stuff to start with, but I've actually gone in and added some of my own firewall rules. Um, there was an issue uh, a while back with, uh, there was a specific malware that was going around affecting uh, Open Media Vault and Docker, that sort of thing. So I just blocked that IP address uh, just to be sure. Uh, it's never come up in the last, well, since I've put it up there, I've never seen it come up here. So I've just got it there as an additional precautionary measure. Um, <clears throat> so I've also got the option of known bots. That's anything that's going to possibly index your site, crawl your site, your applications, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and, and oftentimes uh, those bots may be Google bots or Yahoo bots that are just indexing the internet to put it up on, on the, the search engines. Other bots are not doing great things. Some of them are nefarious. So they've actually got a, a block known bots uh, filter that you can turn on by default. I've done that. And here you can see in the last 24 hours, it has stopped 220 bots from trying to talk to my home server. Also, these 33, uh, those are basically everything that isn't the United States that has tried to get access to my server. Now I understand that, that basically blocking the rest of the world other than my country, it's not a perfect solution, but I'm not in Germany, I'm not in Russia, I'm not in France, I'm not in Australia. So those countries don't need to have access to my server. Now I know that they could use a VPN to bypass that, uh, to, to make themselves available in the US, but it's just kind of a good extra measure to block any country that you're not in or not giving access to explicitly. So I think that pretty much covers uh, Cloudflare. Uh, I keep in mind that I've only ever used their free plans. I've been using their free plans for a long time and they've always worked really well. Uh, in fact, I've actually considered uh, jumping up to one of their paid plans just to try to help pay them back for all of the time that they have saved me uh, just with their really great security in place by default. Uh, I just haven't managed to do that yet. Um, but just understand that you can do all of this on their free plan. So uh, that kind of covers uh, Cloudflare in my opinion. If you've got questions about Cloudflare, definitely let me know in the comment section down below. I'm a big uh, advocate of Cloudflare and I encourage everybody to use it. So on a fairly regular basis, I get people asking me the question of how do I make Nginx Proxy Manager available to the internet? Or how do I make <clears throat> Open Media Vault available to the internet so I can manage those things when I'm not at home? The short answer is don't. Don't forward uh, your OMV port. Don't forward your Nginx proxy port. If somebody gets a hold of, of those ports and gains access, access to your system, there's not much you can do about it. Um, so you wanna make sure that those are only available from inside your network. And of course, uh, the workaround to that is to set up uh, a VPN on your server uh, that grants access to your network. Uh, and of course, I've got uh, uh, videos, I've got a video explaining that. Uh, I'm not actually gonna link to it now that I think about it. I tried to get it set up and it wasn't working correctly. Um, so I will have a link to a, a tutorial that I used yesterday uh, to set up a VPN on a Raspberry Pi. Um, at least that's what I used, uh, but I will link that in the description down below so that you can check that out. Uh, so only make your, your Open Media Vault, your SSH, your Docker, your Portainer available inside your network, uh, with the caveat being unless you're connected via a VPN. Next, I wanna, I wanna skip Nginx Proxy Manager for just a moment, we'll come back to that. But uh, like it says, the, the, these next few things here, keep your, your Open Media Vault up to date. Make sure that you're checking for updates regularly. Keep your server up to date. Uh, SSH into it. Do a sudo apt get or a sudo update or sudo apt update, sudo apt upgrade. Do that regularly. Make sure all of your stuff stays up to date. If you don't, people are going to find exploits to get in. So always make sure that all of your patches and all your updates are done regularly. That's super, super important. Same thing goes with your uh, Docker containers. Um, I, I don't encourage using something like Watchtower uh, to, do, to manage all of your updates, but set up Watchtower in, in uh, notify only mode so that uh, when there is an update, you'll get an email. Uh, then you can go in and manually do the updates if you want to, or if you want to be lazy, feel free to use um, 
uh, Watchtower or Ouroboros. I think that's how it's pronounced. I don't know. Uh, there are uh, containers out there, applications out there that will automatically update all of your containers. Uh, if you if you want to be lazy and do that, go for it. Just understand that it could cause problems if an update goes poorly. Um, but again, keep everything up to date all of the time. Uh, your your server, your Open Media Vault, uh, your Docker containers, keep all of that up to date uh, to help mitigate any kind of potential security leak. Also, when, when we're talking about uh, Docker containers, uh, only use Docker containers from trusted sources. Uh, if you go to hub.docker.com, uh, some of the, 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 the repositories there, like linuxserver.io, is verified. Um, a, a lot of the, the big corporations are verified. Uh, if, you, if you see uh, an application that you want and it's got, say, a million downloads or 500,000 downloads or something, it's probably safe. Uh, if you see something that's got only a couple of downloads, be wary of that. Just make sure that any of the containers you deploy are from known reputable sources. Also, just because a source is reputable, uh, make sure that that, that it's a, a new version or that it's been updated fairly recently. Uh, I see a lot of, uh, you know, like when I look for a certain uh, application, I might see 10 versions of it from, you know, 10 different developers. Um, and, and some of those haven't been updated in two or three or five years. Don't use those. Try to find something that's been updated recently and from a trusted source just to make sure you're not getting into anything that might compromise your server. This next one, um, should go without saying, um, make sure you've got backups of your data. Uh, like my server is currently set up to run a backup uh, three days a week uh, locally, install all of that locally. And then one day a week, it backs all of that up to the cloud uh, where I've always, that way I've always got multiple backups of my stuff. Um, I should probably do more than that. Uh, I should probably run a manual backup and store it somewhere else, give it to a friend, whatever. But you should always have multiple backups of your server just in case. Uh, and this is something I can't stress enough. Set up a backup, a local backup, as well as a remote backup, just to make sure if something goes wrong, your house burns down, whatever, you've still got access to your data somewhere. All right, this last section here, not last thing we're gonna talk about, but the last section uh, in, in this little area here is don't give access to just anyone. And if you have to give somebody access, give them the bare minimum that they need to get by. Uh, the reality is uh, the, 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 the general public not real tech savvy uh, in the grand scheme of things. Now, your friends, your family may be different than that. Um, just because if, if you're watching this, you're probably a fairly tech savvy person. And we tend to uh, kind of congregate with other tech savvy people. Uh, but for instance, I've given my, my cousin, who's not tech savvy, access to my server, but only MB. He can only have access to my media server and nothing else. Uh, he can only log in and watch videos. He can't add videos. He can't delete videos. He can't, he can't do anything other than watch videos. And that's just a precautionary measure to make sure uh, that nothing goes wrong, even accidentally. And that's just kind of a best practice thing. Only give people access to the things they need access to and nothing more than that. Don't give your buddy SSH access to your server. Uh, don't give him root access to your server. Set up a separate account, give him the access as he needs and nothing more. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about here uh, when we're giving access or when we're, we're creating applications and putting the, or giving them access to the internet or giving the internet access to them, I suppose, would be the better way to say this, use a reverse proxy. Uh, in the past, I've talked about uh, traffic. Traffic is great for certain things, uh, though in my opinion, it's not as user-friendly as Nginx Proxy Manager. And that's kind of the next section that I wanna focus on here. Uh, this is a big one that I've been using for several months now, and I've had a lot of really good success with it. Um, so let's kind of just jump over here and uh, take a look at my Nginx proxy manager server. So we're logged in here. And if we just kind of look, we've got our dashboard, our hosts, that's where our applications are going to be is in hosts. Our access list, uh, this is actually going to be a big part of your security uh, that I, I think is a great way that, that they've implemented this. SSL certificates, uh, when you set up an application in uh, Nginx Proxy Manager, you have the option to set up a free Let's Encrypt certificate for your server to add an additional layer of security uh, to encrypt all of the traffic uh, going out. And well, and coming in for that matter, but it, it encrypts all of the traffic on your server to keep prying eyes from looking at what's going on. Uh, users, I, I highly encourage you, uh, if you're going to have multiple people on here, set up everybody as their own separate user. Uh, chances are you're the guy or the person administrating your server. You don't need additional users, most likely. Uh, audit log, here you can just see everything going on. Uh, updated proxy host, deleted proxy host, things like that. 
Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, detailed information as far as you know, who's tried to access from where. I actually reached out to the developer and he doesn't have any plans to add that, which is kind of a bummer, but um, just know that you can kind of see some of the stuff going on uh, with regards to your Nginx proxy manager under audit log. And then we've got settings. Uh, and this is just, uh, if you don't, if somebody tries to go here and nothing is there, what do you want it to do? It just takes them to a congratulations page by default. And that's probably just fine. So let's take a look at hosts. So here you can see that I've got uh, four applications up and running. Um, and you can see the IP address of the server that they're on along with the port there. You can see that they are uh, running a Let's Encrypt uh, SSL for the additional security. You can see that there's uh, the access is access list uh, only. And the status is online, meaning everything's up and running. Things should be working just fine. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's jump over to image or img.dbtech.site. That works just fine uh, without issue there. I tell you what though, let's open this in a new browser. Like so, let's drag this up here. There's Firefox. Everything here should work just fine, but that's because I'm on my home IP address. Now, if I were to come over here and uh, connect and just get myself a new IP address, then if I refresh, now I have to enter a password. Uh, so let's go ahead and cancel that. Let's just go ahead and refresh. In order to get here, I have to put in a username and a password. So if I do that, now I have access. So that's what the access list does. Uh, it, I've, I've currently got it set up uh, to meet one of two criteria. So if let me close that, there we go. So we'll come back over to here and we'll take a look at our access list. Uh, so if, let me change this, we'll go to edit, Access list um, is either publicly accessible, where it means just anybody can access it uh, as long as they know the uh, the URL, or we've got an access list, one user, one rule. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So we come over here to access list. Uh, we can see that we've got authorization as one user. Uh, the access is one rule. If it satisfies any of those rules, uh, you can do that. And four proxy hosts are using this access list. So let's take a look at this access list. And of course I could name this whatever, but I just like access list, so I used it. And here you can say, uh, you know, satisfy any, otherwise it satisfy all. Uh, so if we come over here to auth authorization, I put in a username and a password. That's what I had to enter just a moment ago to get access to my server or to that, that, that website. Uh, the other, so if, if they enter that, that's one way to get in past the security. The other one is to allow my home IP address. So if I'm connected to my home network, uh, either via being home or via the VPN that I've got set up uh, that, that gives me access to my home network, as long as I'm connected from my home IP address, then I'm able to access the sites on my server that are publicly accessible or, or yeah, accessible to the internet rather. Uh, if I'm not home, uh, I'll have to put in a username and password, or I'll have to VPN into uh, my home network to get an IP address from home in order to connect. Okay guys, there you go. That kind of covers everything I wanted to say in this video. Uh, hopefully it made sense. I'm actually gonna have to go back through and edit this video now and uh, try to put it together in such a way that it makes sense to me and hopefully makes sense to you. Uh, but if it did, and I did a good job of the edit and it made sense, do me a favor, give the video a thumbs up, would help me out a bunch. Uh, if you're interested in uh, home server stuff and that kind of thing, I definitely get subscribed. I've got a whole new series coming out here very soon about setting up some stuff on a Raspberry Pi for a kind of a little mini home server. Uh, I just got confirmation back from a couple, a couple of companies last night that are going to sponsor some stuff. Uh, so I'm waiting on hardware to come from them, but definitely get subscribed if you're interested in home server stuff with Docker and Portainer and Open Media Vault, all that good stuff. Uh, but I think with all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up here. As always, thanks for your time. I always appreciate your support and I'll talk to you in the next video.